This is KBLULP in Logan. My name is Richard Arlen Blake, and I'd like to welcome you all back to uh, my next episode of Baladish Anish, Folklore Now. And considering the time lapse that has happened since my last broadcast, I felt I should tell you that I hope everybody had a wonderful St. Patrick's Day and were able to do something interesting rather than just wear green or sing Irish drinking songs while holding your bottle of Aquafina water, like in that commercial. And I hope everyone, of course, had a great Ides of March on the 15th. Not too many people know what that is or what that means, but let's just say the most well-known significant thing to happen on the Ides of March was Julius Caesar being assassinated. But anyway, i just like to give my appreciation to everybody who is tuning in here to my show. I've been thinking about what I ought to be talking about today, what aspect of folklore to consider. There are, of course, a lot of other ghost stories that are kind of interesting that I thought I'd talk about, but after some reflection, I decided to take a slightly different track. First thing I want to ask everybody is... What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you combine the words radio with alien? You might think of a lot of more modern day things, but if you were to think back into the history of old radio, the history of broadcasting, of course, is quite interesting to me as a folklorist because these streams of consciousness, these memes of radio and stories that people give out on the radio are culturally significant things that I think that you would really appreciate if you heard it today, even though it might sound a little strange the way they did their broadcasting back then. Back in 1938, there were a lot of things going on. We were hearing a lot of things about what was happening in Europe and how war was building up. And about Germany gaining power, the Czech Republic being, well, Czechoslovakia being betrayed by a group of politicians because they thought appeasing Hitler would prevent war from happening. Well, there was something else going on in 1938 that a lot of people don't realize if they don't know the history of radio broadcasting is the broadcast by Orson Welles called The War of the Worlds. In his broadcast, he set out a fictitious kind of alien invasion scenario, similar to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds story. Now, Orson Welles and H.G. Wells are not related. Their last names aren't spelt the same, so scratch that idea. H.G. Wells was British. Orson Welles is a British broadcast. Orson Welles was trying to come up with a way to talk about some kind of alien invasion that sounded worth listening to. There was a lot of competition out there as far as radio goes, and you had to do what you could to just catch the people's attention right off the bat, the same as you do today. The way that he decided to do it was instead of just telling some blah blah story about aliens invading making it sound like some audio comic book commentary or whatever. He put it in the format of a news broadcast. He felt that that was the most interesting way in which he could present it and keep people's attention. If people are hearing it in the sense of, okay, this reporter's doing this and he is located here in New Jersey, we are talking to the owner of this farm and those kinds of things, people will pay more attention to it. Now, there are different opinions on what exactly happened when he was doing this broadcast and how people were reacting to it. And it's kind of interesting how different outlets actually answer this question. But the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to play you an audio clip from that broadcast for you. And then what we're going to do is pick it up from there The segment that I'm going to be playing for you, of course, is not going to be the very beginning because this is an hour-long broadcast that Orson Welles did, and I'm definitely not going to be playing this for an hour so that you can 
hear me dissect the thing. I want to get straight to the part where the people listening to the radio probably got some of the stranger ideas and these are the parts of the broadcast where the news actually was talking about things that are happening in society as a result of what they're hearing on the radio. This particular scene is supposedly in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. At the very beginning of the broadcast, he does say the following is fictional, but then after that, we don't hear him going back and confirming that this is an, a fictional broadcast continuously through it. So some people may have gotten the idea that this alien invasion was really happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you this part where they first hear from a reporter talking to the farmer who owns this farm, what it is that he's experienced and what he thinks about it. Mr. Wilmot, uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard. Uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmot. Well, I was listening to the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, closer. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. A professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half chosen and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmot, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway... Yes, Mr. Wilmot, and then you saw something. Well, not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A hissing sound like this. Uh, kind of like a 4th of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was to sleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmot? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to tell No, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen... You've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. Sorry about cutting it off there at that particular moment. It probably sounded like something interesting was coming off and I was cutting it off. However, the reporter just kind of goes off into another tangent from that point, and I wanted you to get a good understanding of what the owner of the farm was thinking when he encountered this object and the impression that he was getting. He didn't seem all that alarmed. He just kind of was curious and surprised about what he saw. The next piece that I'm going to show you is something Orson Welles, of course, is throwing in here to give it more validity, making it sound like this is a really serious broadcast. He's bringing in some scientists. At first, he brings in an astronomer, and he's going to give his understanding of what he sees. So I've got two clips here, two separate clips, where he is interviewing this astronomer. And the astronomer, of course, has his own ideas about what it is. And then as you come to the conclusion of, of these clips that I'm playing for you, there's, some, there's suddenly something that's about something that's suddenly happening. And then that's where I'm going to pick it up after, after I'm done playing this for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. I paint for you a word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, like something out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me, half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of... Yellowish white is curious. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. 
Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, Mr. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and you can see its cylindrical oh, shape. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw and the thing must be hollow. Move it! Keep those men back! 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 Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmer's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain's conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute. Something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Oh, Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! He is caught up by the woods, the fires, the, the gas tank, tanks for the automobiles spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we... I took the broadcast this far because I wanted you to see all aspects of what the astronomer was doing and what he was interacting with and what the reporter did in response to the actions of the astronomer. The reporter is calm there for a little bit and then he closes in and gets closer to what action is going on. He was hearing a sound and saying, oh, look at this. This is an, a weird sound that's going on. And then all of a sudden, something horrible, terrifying happens, and everyone's getting hysterical there. At the end, suddenly, we find that the broadcast is suddenly cut off. What happens then is an announcer from the radio station, supposedly, from this news broadcast, is saying, we have lost contact with our people in Grover's Mill, and we will try and get back to you as soon as we can with what's going on down there. Of course, they're not going to try and sound hysterical if something terrible happened to their reporter there in Grover's Mill. From this point on, it builds up to a kind of climax. There will be one more clip I'm going to show you about this particular aspect and what the climatic element was to this. But as I was saying before, the news outlets who were talking about this in the newspapers about Orson Welles' broadcast, they were all sounding like, oh my gosh, all these people were getting hysterical throughout New England and New York, and people were committing suicide. People were fleeing the cities to go off wherever to try and escape from the aliens. If you read the news outlets as they had it, back then, you'll see that they were hyping this up. But if you talk to some other people, what those news people were talking about, they were just hyping up a bunch of BS because most people were listening to another broadcast that was much more popular than what than the station H.G. Wells worked for. One has to wonder then, the radio 
which was the only alternative sort of broadcast other than newspapers and magazines and everything. So the radio and the newspapers were hyping up a lot of this and making it sound like, oh my gosh, you have done a horrible, horrible thing here, Orson Welles. If you consider what media is supposed to do for this country, it's supposed to be the, should serve the public interest at all times. And then in the days of radio before TV, of course, they were the really big area that people got their news from. Some people still get their news from the radio today, of course. With TV today, we expect to get actual news news from our news outlets, actual factual things that we can trust. And then here come all these news outlets making a hysterical show of what was going on with Orson Welles's broadcast. One has to wonder then, why are these news people doing this? And the simple answer to that, of course, is we want to sell newspapers. The more eccentric the story, the more people are likely to buy their newspapers or listen to their radio broadcasts in the future. Orson Welles did do a public apology, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So up to this point, of course, it's leading up to this. This is the Martian invasion. By this time, they know that it's Martians that are attacking. And then they talk about what the aftermath of the Martian invasion is here. And I'll bring that up to you next before I bring the War of the Worlds part of this podcast to a close. And then I have one more thing I want to share with you. This is pretty close to the end of the War of the Worlds broadcast that I'm going to play for you now. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City, the Bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed. Ten minutes ago, no more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service here below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor, all all manner of boats, overloaded with fleeing population, pulling out from docks. Streets are all jammed, noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute, the the enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river, I can see it from here, wading, wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. 
a bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be timed in space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. The steel cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. A uh, hundred yards away. It's... It's 50 feet. So the first thing that I feel I need to tell you right now, actually, is that earlier in this broadcast, I said something to the effect of H.G. Wells having something to do with this broadcast. Sorry, that was a mistake. Orson Welles is an American. He did this broadcast, and that is why the story starts out in Grover's Mill in New Jersey, and it's not taking place in England like H.G. Wells's story, War of the Worlds, is. So this is Orson Welles, not H.G. Wells. Sorry if I confused anybody with that. I'm really not that stupid that I didn't know that. Now when we get back to what we just heard from these particular people that are giving information. The first voice that you heard on there is supposed to be the Secretary of the Interior calling on the people to be strong and embracing the solidarity and to strike back at the enemy because they will prevail, that the enemy is confined in central New Jersey and they will stay there. So this is what the government official says. That's what government officials always say, that we have things under control, right? Then the next voice is a reporter who's talking about the falling of alien cylinders all around the country. So he's broadcasting in New York, talking about the desperate situation through the city, deadly smoke that's spreading through the city, killing people off. As with others involved with this broadcast, he gets cut off, a bit of the theatrics giving the listeners the impression of, oh my gosh, these reporters are being really brave, they're out here, you know, risking their lives, and each of them seems to be dropping like flies, but another part that I, I didn't play for you involves that same reporter actually talking to one or two refugees, survivors, that had been passing through that part of the state. And of course, those people have different ideas about what's going on. The rest of the broadcast, it's about the destruction and death all around them. There seems to be no survivors in the large cities of the east, with only one or two people surviving, as I said. These are refugees, just like war refugees everywhere. And then finally, the reporter comes to a place where he ends up seeing several aliens. He sees a one of the spaceships sort of stranded there, and there were dead aliens laying on the ground. And of course, he was confused about this, and he goes and investigates. And then this is the point at which we hear that, well, the Earthlings were not able to fight off the Martians. However, the Martians did not have any resistance to the microbes and other disease-infested things on this planet that we had grown accustomed to, and therefore it seems the biological means had finally taken care of the Martians, even despite you know everything that we could do failing, the microbes end up doing them in. 
that of course is a fitting ending and a realistic one because otherwise how could the primitive earthlings have fought off such sophisticated scientifically advanced culture like the martians that they were describing there so if there was anyone who heard this frantically running off to go off somewhere or killing themselves they clearly did all that before getting really close to the end of the broadcast because at the end of the broadcast they say that this is a Columbia Broadcasting System production. This was something that might have been ignored by them and of course they said well what you heard was fictional. When you look outside this day that will probably be a pumpkin. There are not really Martians out there and we want you to celebrate a great Halloween. And that's how it ends. So when we hear about people saying the Americans were running off frantically trying to get away from some imaginary things out there, the people in New York and the people in New Jersey basically knew, at least through most of the broadcast, they knew that there was nothing going on. If they had first were confused, they could have looked outside and seen that there was no fireworks going on across the tri-state area. We still come across conflicting accounts though about what was the result of this particular broadcast. As a folklorist I have to say that it's not my job to delve in and find out the fact. The folklorist's job is to tell the story or bring the stories out so that you could hear them and you can decide what you believe and what you don't. I could delve into the facts behind it but I don't feel like that is a productive thing to do at this particular time. I think you will find it more interesting if you looked into those things yourself or watched the videos that were created by different companies who wanted to tell you what it was that Orson Welles did that was so terrible or if the people back then were just saying, well, who's Orson Welles? Just consider that. As with so many other interesting little tidbits that we might hear on the radio or in media, the things that have been around the longest and with the biggest oomph out there sometimes end up with people spinning off of them or using them as inspirations for their own stuff. And one of the great examples of this in this particular area was there was a Flintstones episode about a band of singers called the Way Outs. Apparently, in order to get the word out about them being out here and they're brand new and they want to spread the word about their existence, apparently the radio broadcasters went out and said, oh, the Way Outs are here. They come from way, way out. They do all these things and it makes it sound like they're actually aliens rather than singers producing this and all of a sudden everyone thinks there's alien invasions going on and that is a little bit of a spin-off from what Orson Welles did here and I'm sure there's others that's just the one that popped into my mind of course I encourage everybody to go and listen to that broadcast yourself that Orson Welles did it is available in many places online so you can easily find it and then you can listen to it and truly appreciate everything and give you a better feeling for it than what I could possibly do in the show that I've just put on here for you. Before I bring this episode of Ballad of Shanish to a close, I did want to discuss something that is a local tradition, a folk tradition, if you will, that takes place here in Logan, Utah. It is affiliated and put on by Aggie Radio that is associated with Utah State University and of course that's the radio station that my podcasts are played on basically. What it is is every year there is a celebration of music, a celebration where people go out to different venues and areas in the local community where they had concerts set up. These companies allowed the radio station to set things up there so that the local band people can play and encouraged people to come in and listen to what is going on in the current environment as far as music goes in the Utah area. A lot of these people are from the Cache Valley area, which is where Logan is, of course, but many of these people also come from other parts of Utah, but most of them also got their start probably in the Logan area, or they knew people who were 
in the Logan area when they got started. This is a kind of folk tradition that you find in many different places throughout the country. I've been to a few music festivals of one kind or another, one of the most famous of which, of course, is the Cowboy Poetry Festival in Elko, Nevada. One of these days I'd like to actually go. So far, when I've gone to Elko, Nevada, I've gone to the museum they have there of the Folk Life Center in Elko, Nevada, but I have yet to actually be to one of these events. And they do take place in January or February when it's kind of cold, so you might think twice about driving through the mountains in order to get yourself to there during that particular time period. But if you are determined, you will go and you will participate. I've been to three of these particular celebrations with Logan City Limits. I, I actually took part directly with the one last year. This year I was just a an observer, but I do know all the people or most of the people there affiliated with the radio station and they do do a great job and they put up a great performance. They set everything up just right. I always look forward to this particular event every year. When I do end up moving out of this area, when I have graduated with my master's degree, this is one of those things that I'm going to miss leaving behind. Always think about what folk traditions that you might have in your local areas where you grew up. You might think back on and say, oh gee, they were always doing this in my town when I was growing up, but I never really went to see them or I really didn't appreciate what was going on because I was just walking around following my parents or whatever. That's one thing that I didn't always appreciate until I had moved out of my original comfort zone at home and first moved to Utah to go to school and then I suddenly realized there were a whole bunch of things that I missed being able to take part in because I was just I guess self-centered and not thinking about what these people were really doing and why these particular events are so important to us, to everybody. These events are what make us unique. This is what makes this place worth being in. This is something that is uniquely of this area. Logan City Limits, this is uniquely Cache Valley and I will definitely miss it once I've moved out. Having said that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to this fifth episode of Balladition Ish. This has been a really interesting research that I was doing here in Orson Welles broadcast and, and talking about it. A lot of people don't always appreciate these kinds of things that people do that become famous. And I found this particular broadcast to be something that it is forever cemented in the minds of broadcasters, people who are dealing with radio. And as always, I do encourage people to send me things that they might like me to play for them on my podcast, Bale edition ish or give me a story or some information, things that you would like me to discuss. I would love to be able to do that with the next podcast. I'm not sure when that one will be, but there will be a number six coming up. And in order to get that to me, you simply send it to folklorenow33 at gmail.com. And then I can broadcast then whatever you've sent me as long as it's appropriate. And I thank you all again for listening to this episode of Bail Edition-ish, and I do hope you have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.